But this seed that mingles itself with the, with the seed of men, uh, the first time this happened was in Genesis chapter number 6, when the angels, sons of God, saw the daughters of men, came to them, and cohabited with them, and the Nephilim were born. Yeah. They called just men. It already said that men had daughters. Why did they make the distinction of sons of God? Now, what we need to cover here is, who are these sons of God in the Old Testament? Who are they? Well, it says here, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Now, here's the distinction made right here. You say, what's the distinction? Well, it just says, normally. Well, men, men were born, women were born, they got married. Is that, is that weird? No, that's normal. That happens all the time. Well, then what, the, what is the need to bring this into it then? Why did he say... Why did he say that daughters were born unto them? Okay, that's normal. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, here's the distinction. He just said that men were born, and women were born, and daughters were born unto them. But it says here that the sons of God, whoever this group was, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The sons of God saw these daughters. Whoever these sons of God were, were, they were not human beings or they weren't men, normal men. If they were, then why weren't they called son of men? Why weren't they called just men? It already said that men had daughters. Why did they make the distinction of sons of God? Job 2, verse 1, and Job 38, 4 through 7. We see the sons of God are clearly angels. They can't be men. Now, when, when, when God challenges Satan and says, hey, you know, in a Job 1, 2, 1, and where are you coming from? Where have you been? Satan says, well, I was on earth. And in order for him to be, to say that means he was there. And it means he's not there now. So he's somewhere off of earth. I say he's in the throne room of heaven. The many sort have been previously referred to in Genesis as sons of God in any kind of spiritual sense, and except for Adam himself, they could not have been, have been sons of God in a physical sense. In context, such a meaning would be strained to say the least, in the absence of any kind of explanation. The only obvious and natural meaning without such clarification is that these beings were sons of God rather than of men because they had been created, not born. Such a description, of course, would apply only to Adam and to the angels whom God had directly created. We're sons of Adam, not sons of God. The term son of God in the scripture is always used of a direct creation of God. That includes Adam and it includes the angels. In fact, that particular phrase, if you search the entire Old Testament in the Hebrew, it's always used of angels. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Okay, stop there for a minute. Now I've talked about this in other studies, and again, controversial here according to some people, but uh, the sons of God in the Old Testament are always 100% of the time, the time, they are references to angels. Read the book of Job. The sons of God never once are men. Regular. I am absolutely sick of these false teachers teaching that the sons of God in the Old Testament were angels and not men. These men are sickos and perverts. They pervert the Word of God. They are professing King James Bible believers. The King James Bible does not teach that the sons of God in the Old Testament were angels or fallen angels. They don't teach that devils were the sons of God. That is a satanic doctrine of devils. And if you teach that trash, uh, Brian Denlinger, Jason Cooley, all you other sickos, you need to repent. You're deceiving the brethren. You're causing confusion. You didn't get that doctrine from the King James Bible. You got it from fables like the book of Enoch. I'm going to refute this nonsense right now. So, let's look at these phrases, the sons of God, in the Old Testament. The ones that are always 
under fire are Genesis 6, 2 and verse 4, and Job 1, verse 6, chapter 2, verse 1, Job 38, verse 7. Okay, but there are other references to the sons of God that they won't mention, such as Hosea 1.10, where it says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Yeah, but it says living God. Okay, well, it's the same. The sons of God. Israel. In fact, all these other passages that I'm going to mention... The Lord is referring to the children of Israel as his sons. Hosea 11.1, 1, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and, and called my son out of Egypt. Isaiah 43.6, I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far, and daughters from the ends of the earth. Exodus 4.22, And thou shalt say unto the Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In Exodus 4.23, And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me, and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So these heretics, these false prophets, will say, every time in the Old Testament when the sons of God are mentioned, it's speaking of angels. Well, what about all those passages that I just read? It's speaking of the sons of God, and they are the children of Israel. So you're a liar. You're a liar, Brian Denlinger. Sicko. Now, let's look at Genesis 6. Let's look at the context of it. The context of Genesis 6 emphasizes the sin of humans, not angels, as the reason for the flood. Verses 3, verse 7, 12, and 13. Let's have a real quick look at that. Let's have a quick look-see, shall we? The King James Bible. Okay, Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, not angels, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man, not angels, was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only continually evil. Verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Are you getting the picture here? Man, man, man. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse 12 and 13 speaks of all flesh, speaking of man and um, the creatures on the earth. Angels don't have flesh. They're spirits. Get the picture, people. The sons of God were men, not angels. Let's look at the term sons of God and the daughters of men. The term sons of God is never used for angelic beings in sacred scripture. The angels were not created to be sons of God. They were created to be servants of God. There is no father-son relationship between God and the angels. The angels stand before God as the servants and he their owner master. They were created as ministering spirits. The term sons of God actually denotes the special relationship of man to God as his children. Furthermore, such terms as father and son do not only show existence of relationship, but also the ability to procreate, be fruitful, and multiply. But the angelic beings were not created to procreate, being spirits. They are always, they always portray as men, never as women. They are asexual, sexless, Mark 12:25. Several statements in Genesis about Seth's descendants indicate that the sons of God applies to them. They began to call upon the name of the Lord, Genesis 4, verse 26. They walked with God, Genesis 5, verse 24. And they found favor in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6, verse 8. Second, Genesis 5, 1 through 3 restates that Adam was created in God's image and that Seth was begotten in Adam's image. This implication, the implication is that the line of Adam through Seth constitutes the sons of God. Third, the line of Cain is pictured in exactly the opposite light. Cain is driven out from the presence of God. Lamech, a descendant of Cain, takes two wives, contrary to the standard established in the garden. When Cain murders his brother, God confronts him with his deed, yet when Lamech commits murder, the absence of God is painfully obvious. Cain laments that his punishment is too great to bear, and Lamech boasts that he is able to take care of himself. He doesn't need God's protection. The primary characterization of Cain's line is that they were becoming increasingly separated from God. The classification of the sons of God and daughters of men in two different categories does not necessarily mean that they are a human and non-human group. So people look at the daughters of men and they say, well, that has to be speaking to mankind, so therefore the sons of God must not be men. They have to be angels. 
not, but that is false. In other parts of the Old Testament, similar expressions are used to mean men. For example, Judges 2, or Judges 20, verses 1 and 2, speaks of all the tribes of Israel assembling for war against the tribe of Benjamin. Therefore, a distinction is made between the tribes of Israel and Benjamin. This, however, does not exclude Benjamin from being classified as one of the tribes of Israel. And other Old Testament uh, examples are Jeremiah 32, 20, where the distinction is made between Israel and among men. Also, Genesis 14, 16, where we have the classification of lot, women, and people. Scripture records that Satan does make several attempts to defile the promised seed, but all others, all other attempts are done by men, not, nor, not angels. Also, the Old Testament frequently warns against intermarriage of God's covenant people with those outside of his covenant. Exodus 34, 16, in addition, Scripture speaks of unwarranted marriages with their own people, within their own people. Genesis 24, uh, chapter 27, verse 46, chapter 28, verse 1. It also continues into the New Testament. Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Okay? This is consistent. What the Bible teaches is that the sons of God always have been and always will be men, never angels. Let's look at the term took wives. Genesis 6, 2 says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, they took them wives of all which they chose. The phrase took wives is a standing expression for a marriage relationship. There is nothing in the context that would indicate these are other than real marriages, and angels do not marry. Okay? Let's look at the giants. Okay? Because those who support and teach this false doctrine that the sons of God were angels or devils, uh, they also teach that the giants were Nephilim, that they were some kind of a hybrid between women and, and angels. This is completely false. It comes from the book of Enoch and other fables. It's, uh, it's disgusting. But let's look at this. Genesis 6, 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. These are physical giants, like Goliath, 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verse 4 and 21, chapter 9, 19, verse 20. Furthermore, Numbers 13.33 uses giants twice to describe sons of human parents, not angels. The human father is Anak. Numbers 13, verse 22, 28, and 33. If giants denotes offspring of human parents, then Numbers 13.33, then why not in Genesis 6.4? Okay. Therefore, it is more proper to understand the statement about giants as an explanatory parenthesis. It was during the time that giants were on the earth that the sons of God married the daughters of men. Thus, neither the sons of God nor the mighty men had anything to do with the giants. When it says they were mighty men, that they refers back to the sons of God, not the giants. I don't understand why it's so hard for people to, to understand that, that, that giants can just be born to... Um, you know, just born between men and women, okay? It's, it's a result of the fall, you know, it's a deformity. Uh, anyway, let's look at the passages in Job now. Job 1, 6 and 2, 1 talks about the sons of God presenting themselves before the Lord. Job 1, 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And Job 2, 1 basically says the same thing. But... Let's see here. This is not, the location of these verses is not in heaven, okay? Consider the following verses. Where is their location, on earth or in heaven? Leviticus 14.11, And the priest that maketh him clean shall present the man that is to be made clean and those things before the Lord. Present before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So here's something being presented before the Lord, uh, obviously on the earth. Other examples are Leviticus 16.7, Leviticus 16.10, 1 Samuel 10.19. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations, and ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands on the earth, not in heaven, obviously. Jeremiah 36.7, Jeremiah 42.9, Daniel 9.20 says, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. So there's just a number of passages speaking of presenting something or people presenting themselves before the Lord, and it's on earth. So why do people want to say that this is in heaven, in Job? Because they want to 
teach this false teaching. They want to please Satan, I guess. Anyway, uh, so let's look at the context of Job 1, 6 and 2, 1. In Job chapter 1, verse 1, it starts off with, There was a man in the land of Uz, his name was Job. That man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Okay, he was perfect, upright, feared God, eschewed evil. Those sounds like attributes of someone who would uh, have the title as a son of God, does it not? Job 1.5 says, And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings, according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, thus Job did continually. So he sent and sanctified them, and offered burnt offerings. Is it a far stretch to assume that Job was one of the sons of God, and may be possible that he offered burnt offerings when presenting himself before the Lord? And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him uh, in the land, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? It is logical to conclude that Job was among the sons of God who were presenting themselves before the Lord on the earth when Satan came among them as well. Okay? Uh... So, you know, the, the congregation gathered, uh, you know, just like people would have fellowship today to, to worship, praise the Lord together, offer, you know, offerings, whatever. Job was among them. Satan came among them, too. And then God's like, you know, have you, you know, noticed Job over there, you know? He's in the assembly with you on the earth. Um, furthermore, the location of Job 1.6 and 2.1 cannot be in heaven because Satan has been cast out of heaven since before the fall of man. Okay? And people say, well, it doesn't matter what people believe about the sons of God. It's not, a, it doesn't, it's not a concern about salvation, but it's a concern about Scripture. Okay? The Holy Word of God, the King James Bible, is supposed to be revered and respected. Okay? And, you know, people just say, well, you can, people can believe this that they want, and they can believe that, and we can have these differences and all that. Well, the, there are some verses in the Bible that, you know, we could say, you know, there could be some different interpretations, but those verses, those passages are really pretty slim. I mean, obviously, the Bible is really particular about a lot of things, okay? It's easy to see things. If you do some studying and research, there is no way that the sons of God were angels, okay? Satan was cast out of heaven at the fall. Um... We don't call devils sons of God. Okay, those, that's satanic. So let's look at the fact that Satan came with them also. Um, look at Zechariah 3, 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Here's Joshua, the high priest, on the earth, with Satan at his right hand. Okay? Um, so... Just like today, when, when people gather for fellowship, Satan can come among them. Okay? This is all on earth. Since God is holy and absolutely without sin, Isaiah 6, 3, and since he will not even look on evil, Habakkuk 1, 13, how can Satan be in heaven? The answer is Satan cannot be in heaven. Satan has been cast out of heaven since before the fall of man. Jesus saw the fall of Satan, Luke 10, 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Satan was cast out of heaven, and a third of the angels came with him. Revelation 12, 3 and 4 speaks of the great dragon, the great red dragon, and how he, his tail drew a third part of the stars from heaven and cast them to the earth. Um, Satan was on the earth before the fall of man. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The serpent is Satan, not a literal snake, or, or Satan going into a snake, or taking on the body of a snake, or any of that. That's nonsense, too, and I'll refute that in the future. But, uh, you know, that's kind of like the same as this false doctrine, that the sons of God are angels that people teach. Um, what about Revelation 12, 9? 
Um, because in Revelation 12, it speaks of, it seems like there's two casting outs of heaven for Satan. So what's going on there? In 2 Corinthians 12, 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul provides a major revelation that there are three heavens. In this passage, he seemingly talks about himself being taken up to the third heaven, where God the Father and Jesus dwell. The second heaven is the universe, or outer space, and the first is our atmosphere, or air. The Bible indicates that Satan and some of his demons are allowed to move in this space. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. In 612, in this age, Satan and his highest ranking angels can still oppose the work of God and hinder the angels of God. Daniel 10, 10 through 14, within the boundaries of the middle or second heaven. The battle recorded in Revelation uh, 12, 9 removes Satan from this realm. You know, <coughs> that happens in the middle of Daniel's uh, 70th week. And uh, so... You know, it could also be to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. Get Satan out of that, that second heaven there. Now, let's look at Job 38, 7. Job 38, 6 and 7. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Many assume this passage is speaking of creation of the earth, and since men were not in existence for the creation of the earth, then the sons of God mentioned must be angels. But the problem is that the angels were not in existence before the creation of the earth either. Exodus 20.11 says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It is possible that the angels were created on the fourth day. Genesis 1.16 says, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Uh, angels are referred to as stars multiple times in Scripture. Daniel 8.10, Revelation 1.20, and other passages in Revelation, uh, such as chapter 8, verse 12, chapter 9, verse 1, chapter 12, verse 4. So one can conclude that when he created the, the stars... It's also him creating the angels, but regardless um, of when the angels were created, it must have been after the creation of the earth. Um, the title Sons of God is given to professors of religion obtained before the times of Job, see Genesis 6-2, which we already talked about, who might be saved, who might be said to sing together and shout for joy when they met for social worship, see Job 1-6, and especially when any fresh discoveries were made to them of the Messiah and salvation by him. Thus Abraham, one of these sons of God, saw Christ's day and was glad and shouted for joy. John 8, 56. For these words are not necessarily to be restrained to the coming or to the laying of the foundation of the cornerstone of the earth. The cornerstone is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. First Peter 2.6 Wherefore also is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, uh, what does it say? Precious? <laughs> yeah, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. In allusion to what is done, uh, delaying of the foundation of any building of note, see Ezra 3.10, for it may be repeated from Job 38.4, when, when thou, where was thou when the morning starts, uh, may also refer to any rejoicing before the time of Job, at which he was not present. The morning stars are simply stars that have human characteristics applied to them. It's a literary device that is used in Job 38.7 called personification. Personification is a figure of speech which takes a human characteristic and applies it to an object, quality, or idea. Other examples, Luke 19.40, And he answered and said unto them, I tell you, that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. The stones cry out, no. Isaiah 55.12, For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace, and the mountains, the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. In Psalm 96.11, Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. There are many literary devices used in Job 38. Certainly, uh, not everything is to be taken literally, okay? And I've put this on my website. If you go to acceptyoubeconverted.com, go to the KJV, and then the literary forms or literary devices. And I'm working on that list there. Um, this is important stuff that we need to know as King James Bible believers, um, as students of the Word of God. We need to understand that not everything in the Bible is literal. Um, there are figures of speech, metaphors, personification, and uh, 
a lot of times it's obvious, sometimes it might not be, but we need to uh, be aware of those things. Or you're going to get messed up in your doctrine. You know, we teach in doctrines of devils like Brian Moonen, or, well, Brian Moonen and uh, <laughs> Brian Denlinger and Jason Cooley and all those other people. Heretics. Uh, let's see. Got a couple more things to cover here. Let's talk about Jude 5 through 7. Jude 5 through 7. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, hallelujah, Lord, uh, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth and for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, people often argue that Jude 5 through 7 proves that the sons of God were angels in the Old Testament. They will compare Jude 5 through 7 to Genesis 6. They argue that the angels in Jude verse 6 were condemned for following after strange flesh in verse 7 and compare this to the sons of God taking themselves wives of the daughters of men in Genesis 6. This is completely nonsensical. I have shown the context of Genesis 6 has absolutely nothing to do with angels. Not to mention Genesis 6 speaks of taking wives, not fornication. Hebrews 1 5 says God has never called an angel his son. Matthew 22 30 says angels don't marry, etc, etc. Still, they refuse to hear sound doctrine and use circular reasoning, stating that Jude 5 through 7 proves that angels were the sons of God in Genesis 6, and Genesis 6 proves that the sons of God were, are the angels mentioned in Jude 5 through 7. Let's examine their claim of what Jude 5 through 7 teaches. Jude 5 through 7 speaks of three judgments on three different entities for three different reasons. Usually they do not use verse 5, but verse 6 starts with and, so to get the complete context, we need to go back to when this particular passage starts. Jude 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. This is speaking of the people saved out of Egypt. The judgment is that they're destroyed, and the reason is because they believe not. Jude 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains of darkness unto the judgment of the great day. This is speaking of angels. Their judgment is that they are reserved in everlasting chains. And the reason is they left their own habitation. Jude 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. This is the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Their judgment is eternal fire. And the reason is fornication, going after strange flesh. It should be painfully obvious that it was Sodom and Gomorrah alone that were judged for going after strange flesh and not the angels or the people saved from Egypt. The angels were judged for leaving the first estate in heaven when they followed Satan at his fall. But what does it mean that the angels were reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day? Also mentioned in 2 Peter 2.4. 2 Peter 2.4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. When the angels followed Satan and left their first estate, they sealed their deal to their own damnation. They have absolutely no chance for redemption. Jesus said that hell was created for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, and an everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. They are not in hell as of yet, but it is a certainty for their future, and they know it. Matthew 8, 28, and 29 the devil, speaking to Jesus, said, Have you come here to torment us before the time? Revelation 12.12 12 says that Satan knoweth that he has a short time. Um, now let's go over to some more objections to the idea, that the satanic idea in teaching that uh, the sons of God were angels in the Old Testament. Why didn't Moses say angels if he meant angels? There are many references to angels in the books that Moses wrote, and each time it refers to the angels, it calls them angels, never the sons of God. The only exception is Genesis 3.24, when, when he calls them cherubims. Some examples of him calling angels angels is Genesis 19, verse 1 and verse 15, chapter 28, verse 12, chapter 32, verse 1. Therefore, calling them angels here is anything but obvious. To the contrary, the angel view 
would seem more inconsistent in this context of Genesis where angels are never specifically mentioned. God has never called an angel his son, period. Hebrews 1.5 says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He hasn't called them a son at any time. Angels don't marry, plain and simple. Matthew 22, verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Angels are spirits. A major problem with the, view, the angel view is that they are ministering spirits. They do not have a, a, a corporal form. Hebrews 1, 7 says, in the angels, And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. Hebrews 1, 14 says, they are, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvations? Okay, they don't have a body. They're not flesh and bone. They're spirits. Demons are limited by God's control and have limited power. The story of Job makes it clear that Satan could only do what God gave him permission to do and nothing more. Okay? So, this is just a... It's a false satanic doctrine to teach that the sons of God in the Old Testament or any time were angels. Um, to, to equate devils with sons of God is disgusting and satanic. To say that Satan has access in heaven when he was cast out is satanic and evil. So it's wicked. And uh, I just pray that you who watch this are open to the things that I've presented, all these scriptures, all the arguments, um, I pray that the Lord will reveal this to you. And so I'll go ahead and pray right now, actually. Lord God, thank you for this wonderful day, this beautiful weather, the opportunity to record this video, and I just pray that those who watch this, will, you will give them understanding, you will show them things in the scriptures, in your word. I thank you for your word. Thank you for your son who died for us on the cross so that we can have forgiveness of sins, Lord God. God, I just pray that you will just open the eyes of the people um, to this teaching that the sons of God were men and not angels. Um, show them how wrong it is to teach otherwise. I just thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so thanks for watching. God bless. Hey guys, so I just want to go over just a little bit more on the Sons of God thing. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit more that I didn't read about um, objections to the angels' view. Uh, I said that angels are spirits, and I'm going to go into that a little bit further. Since angels are spirits, Hebrews 1.14, or spiritual creatures, they do not ordinarily have physical bodies, Luke 24.39. Therefore, they cannot usually be seen by us unless God gives us a special ability to see them. Examples of that are Numbers 22:31, 2 Kings 6:17, and Luke 2:13. In their ordinary activities of guarding us and protecting us, Psalm 34:7-91-11, Hebrews 1:14, and joining us in worship to God, Hebrews 12:22. They are invisible. However, from the time to ain't from, from time to time, angels took on bodily form to appear to various people in Scripture, Matthew 28, 5, and Hebrews 13, 2. Though good angels at times assume some physical form, it is not the case with evil angels. There is not one biblical example of angels taking on a physical form. Huh, wow. Take note of that. God would have to grant them that ability. Angelic cohabitation with earthly women does not seem to be a possibility. God created humans and animals after their kind, Genesis 1.27, which means there are limits to the extent that they can reproduce. If angels are sexless, deathless creatures without physical form and had no need to perpetuate their kind, it does not seem likely that they could reproduce, even if they wanted. There is no reference in scripture to fallen angels ever having a body. And I'm going to read a little bit more about uh, demons are limited by God's control and have limited power. And I said the story of Job makes it clear that Satan could only do what God gave him permission to do and nothing more. Job 1.12 and 2.6 This great power of angels is derived from God. 
and the angels remain dependent upon his favorable will to exercise it. They are restricted to acting within the limits of his permission. This is true even of Satan, whose ability to afflict Job was, circum, uh, was circumscribed the will of the Lord. Job 1, 12, and 2, 6. God's angels act only to carry out God's commands. There is no instance of their acting independently. Only God does the miraculous. Psalm 72, 18. As creature angels are subject, subject to the limitations of creaturehood. However great their power may be, it is nevertheless subject to all the limitation that belongs to creatures. Uh, angels, therefore, cannot create, they cannot change substances, they cannot alter the laws of nature, they cannot perform miracles, cannot act without means, and they cannot search the heart. For all these are, in scriptures, declared to be prerogatives particular to God. The power of angels is therefore, one, dependent and derived, two, must be, it must be exercised in accordance to the laws of the material and spiritual work. Three, their intervention is not optional, but permitted or commanded by God, and at his pleasure. Since this is the case, God would have to have allowed these angels to assume human bodies to be able to produce this race of half-angel, half-human. This is inconsistent with the character of God as revealed in Scripture. He does not participate in sin. So there's that. More arguments against it. This King James Bible simply does not teach that the sons of God in the Old Testament were angels, ever. Um, and so I saw a video yesterday of Brian Denlinger answering questions in his comment sections. Someone asked him about the sons of God. You know, he went over the scriptures, uh, said that they had to be angels, didn't really give any reasons at all, didn't, you know, he can't give any reasons to support it. Uh, but... Well, one thing that he said, though, that's interesting, is that um, the Roman gods or, or whatever, Greek, I don't know, he said, you know, there's examples of, you know, gods mating with uh, men, uh, you know, with women, and and having, you know, hybrid, like uh, Hercules, he gave an example of, I think. Um, the funny thing is, though, that a lot of these heresies, these false doctrines and stuff, they come from pagan religions being mixed in with the Bible. And, you know, Denlinger says, he catches that, you know, with everything else, the Jesuits and all this. You know, the Catholic Church, they, you know, they they turn the, the, the goddess Isis into Mary, you know. And you can see that, but you can't see uh, this false teaching that the sons of God were angels is you know, from pagan beliefs and fables mixed in with scripture. Okay. Uh, and so this is another thing. These new modern versions, which I'm glad that I can finally actually put some of these to use, and I have a little collection here. I'm still collecting them. Um, but I have all the, you know, the popular ones. And uh, they will actually change the sons of God to angels, and they will change giants to Nephilim. So they, they, it's it's a gross uh, distortion of the Bible. They just put in what doctrines they want. They just change things and say, well, this is what it is. And uh, so I'm going to read some of them. And I, I looked at the New King James, and surprisingly, it doesn't seem to really change anything concerning these. But the NIV does. So I'll start with the NIV. Here is the New International Version. Okay, so let's look at, which actually was it, the non-inspired version. That's a better better term, I guess. You know, it, it removes the words sodomite, fornication, truce breakers, wine bibbers, carnal, slothful, unthankful, effeminate, damnation, backbinding, vanity, levi leviciousness, whoredom, devils, lucifer, brimstone, bottomless pit. It, rever it removes all those words uh, completely from the Bible. Uh, so let's see here. Let's look at the Genesis passages. Genesis 6. It'll take me a while to get through these <laughs> to find them. Genesis 6. Okay. Well, Genesis 6 1, it says sons of God. So that's 
the same. Uh, Genesis 6, 4 says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. So they replaced giants with Nephilim. And let's look at the Job passages. Job 1, Job 1, 6, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. I wonder if this, how this can pick it up. Probably not good. It's probably not a good idea, but in the future I'll get another camera so I can do close-up zoom in. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, NIV changes um, sons of gods to angels in Job, and it changes the giants to Nephilim in Genesis. Okay. This one's really interesting. The Living Bible. This is the curse word Bible. Uh, let's see. Genesis 6. Genesis 6. <laughs> Genesis 6 1. Now a population explosion took place upon the earth. It was at this time that beings from the spirit world looked upon the beautiful women and took any they desired to be their wives. <laughs> uh, those from the spirit world. Yeah, okay. Well, it seems to be in line with what these false teachers teach. Maybe they need to get a living Bible. So they can, they can come out of the closet and show what true heretics they really are. Oh, Job, where are you? Job, Job. Job 1. Oh, I forgot to check for the giants thing in Genesis. I'll have to go back. Job 1, 6. One day as the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. They just changed sons of God with angels. So let's go back to Genesis 6 in the Living Bible. I want to see what the giants... Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, this just outright teaches the heresy that these people teach. Uh, they definitely need a Living Bible. That's... <laughs> Um, so Genesis, or yeah, Genesis six two in the Living Bible says, in those days and even afterwards, when the evil beings from the spirit world were sexually involved with human women, their children became giants, of whom so many legends are told. Okay, I guess it does say giants, but anyways, it says the evil spirits, and let's see. Let's look at the Good News version, the Catholic edition. Okay. Genesis 6. Genesis 6 1. I thought at first that this would have it right here, um, because the title or whatever, Genesis 6, 1, it says, Human Wickedness. So I was like, okay, it understands that the focus is on man. But it starts out, when people had spread all over the world and daughters were becoming born, some of the heavenly beings saw that these young women were beautiful. So they looked, they took the ones they liked. Hmm... Okay, and it says there were giants. So it keeps giants, but it says heavenly beings. I'll just look at one more. Uh, well, I was going to look at a couple more. I guess I'll look at a couple more. Uh, let's look at the ESV, because it's pretty popular. Oh... Uh, the extremely stupid version. 
Genesis 6. Okay. It keeps the sons of God. But verse 4, it says the Nephilim. And let's look in Job. I'm sure that it changes it to angels. Could be wrong, though. No, it says sons of God. Let's see what Job 38.7 says. Okay, it says sons of God. So they just changed the giants to Nephilim. Still bad enough. Not to mention all the other errors in it. Verses removed and passages removed and whatever else. Okay, one more. We'll look at the Amplified Bible. Genesis 6. says sons of God says giants and let's go to Job and of course even if these Bibles agree with the King James as far as uh, you know the sons of God and giants there's still many other verses removed and many other errors so these Bibles are corrupt Genesis 1 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons, and then in parentheses it says the angels of God came to present themselves before the Lord. So, Job changes it there. Anyways, the sons of God were men, okay, probably descendants of Seth. Um, and I would even say that, you know, probably Noah was one of the sons of God. He was obviously one of the sons of God who didn't go after the daughters of men, but apparently a majority, or maybe almost all of them besides Noah and his family did. Uh, the corruption was very bad then. Um, it's because of violence, is what the Lord says, and because they went after uh, the heathen women. It's That's all throughout Scripture. Don't mingle you know, with the heathens. So... Um, I guess that's all I got to say on that subject. So, again, thanks for watching. God bless. Dear friend, have you heard the gospel, the good news of the Lord and Savior? And this is the gospel. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day. First Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15:1-4. Jesus Christ is the only before the beginning of God's love, he will exist for us. He was made flesh and walked us. John 1.14. He was born of the virgin and he was born of the virgin. He was sinless. He was crucified. 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 He was through his blood is the forgiveness oh, of the sins. For God, what is What is sin? Sin is the transgression of God's law. First John 4. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. All have sinned. Romans 3, 23. The gift of God is eternal life. Romans 6, 23. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 115. The King James Bible is the inspired, inerrant, preserved Word of God. All of the modern Bibles are corrupt. Stay away from buildings called churches. They are snares of the devil. Visit my website, www.acceptyebeconverted.com. Thank you and God bless. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven.